I want to say a special welcome to a church that is in Toronto, and this church is, is pastored by a good friend of mine. His name is Vijay, and in a few weeks, you're going to meet him. But as we were thinking and praying about this teaching series that we're doing today, uh, this church in Ontario, in Toronto, they, they wanted to learn with us, so they're actually tuning in right now. People at the well, everybody at the well, welcome. We're so happy. I, I would say, let's just say hi to them and welcome them. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, uh, those are French claps. Those are French claps. I'm bringing the French clapping to them. Uh, but uh, everyone at the well, we are so grateful to do this together. And, and this is such a special gift for us to know that the topic that we're looking at together with them and with many of you here is a topic that is concerning many churches around Canada and North America. It has to do with something that for years I think we talk about or we maybe hear about, but we never really slow down to think about what it means that we're living in a time where more and more people are disconnected from the story of Jesus, the story of faith, the story of the church. And oftentimes when I travel or I'm you know, visiting, and especially when I think about being with some of my friends in Toronto and Pastor Vijay especially, I often use this phrase that I want to just begin the series with and I want to share it with you. And the phrase is that Quebec is the place where all of our evangelistic ideas come to die. Okay, and, and if you've never heard that word of evangelism, if you have, maybe it's just negative. It's this idea that at the heart of the Christian story, we are invited by God to share with others what God has been doing in our lives. I don't know if this ever happened to you. You go to a restaurant, you go somewhere, and it's amazing, and, and you want to share it with somebody. Something good happens to you, you want to tell them. But after a while, I think in our culture, people don't hear the good part of us wanting to share with them about Jesus. They hear all the painful, weird, strange things they've seen on TV, things that have happened to them, weird experiences they've had with church. And I think we are living at a time where the only way to think about it is we are living at the end of the way we've always thought about evangelism. We are really living at the end, not of God being at work, but at the end of the way we've always thought about sharing about God. At the end of how we used to do it. And one of these things is going to be really hard for us because for many of us, the way we learned about Jesus, the way we learned about God, the way we learned about the Bible is not even going to translate with our kids or with our grandchildren. It's, it's going to be harder than we thought. And if we're not careful, we're going to live in the cycle of, oh, the good old days when we just all walked to church, you know, whatever you hear in your head, you know. And, and there's people who just live in the good old days. We just went to church and everybody believed the right things. Those days are over. They are so over. And you know what? We can be depressed about that. We can be discouraged about that. Or we can say, God, you have always been with your people when they get serious about sharing with others how much you love them. You've always been with us. And so this is kind of, for me, maybe you feel like an elephant in the room kind of topic. And I was talking to some leaders in the church, and maybe for those of you in Toronto, you'll, you'll get this. There's no French translation for elephant in the room. Like, it doesn't really translate, like, there's words like the, the king is naked, you know, or the emperor has no clothes, like, there's ideas like that. But there's no way of saying, this is something we all feel, but nobody knows how to really talk about it. I grew up in a context where when I felt this tension of being like, I don't know what I believe, I'm not sure who to talk to about this, I don't think I want to go to church where my parents went to church, or, you know, it was a weird experience. There was always two tensions that I always lived through. Maybe you think about your own life. One is... I mean, don't worry about that. God's going to send a revival, okay? So I don't know if you've never heard that word, like a revival. Just have to keep praying and magically, like the rain, it's just going to come and everybody's just going to say yes to Jesus. Any of you ever hear that idea? Yeah, maybe some of you have. If you haven't, the Lord has protected you. Okay, so there, there's, there was that sense and, and whenever there was that movement, now we really believe that God has done that in history. That does happen. But I remember these painful moments where people in church talked about this revival, oh, there's going to be a move of God, and every year more and more of my friends left church. So I'm like, something doesn't really connect. And it, does it grieve anybody that people are leaving? So I had this one tension of just like almost a shortcut prayer revival, or I had the other one, which is always juicier, the rapture, okay? Some of you maybe never heard of that, but it's this idea that in some churches we're just waiting for God to come back and take us away. Okay, so I, I lived in this like strange tension. I'm like, we want God to do something amazing, but we want him to really take us out of here. But we hope he does something amazing, but, but uh, we hope he takes us out of here. And I was like always living in that tension. I'm like, is anyone else confused about this? Is anyone else confused that 
Our kids or our grandchildren, people we love, people in Quebec are like, we are so done with church and religious people and the Bible. We have a lot of stories. And you know what? Some of those stories are the most painful stories you'll ever hear. One of the most painful things we have to do as we think about this topic is to get honest about the times where we've made it so confusing for people to understand God's love. Where we actually, we're the ones who have actually put the hurdles in the way. And so part of the series is I want us to feel that. And no matter where you're watching from, you know, I know you at the well are thinking about this with us. Like we want to just be open to the fact that in this painful season, Jesus has some good news for us. And the good news is that he's always been with his people when they get serious about this. And getting serious about it, it means that we're willing to talk about like the elephant in the room. Like if you live in Quebec, and maybe those outside of Quebec don't know this, like on a weekly basis, I get like an update, closing this church, church down, historic building, turning into a condo. And I'm like, just watching and thinking, okay, what does this mean? And what can we do? Or what is God excited to do through us? Now, what I wanted to do as as we start the series is not only celebrate that we're learning with another church, but I also have some questions that I want you to maybe think of, or as I put them up on the screen, I want you to think of a question that you have that maybe makes it hard to talk about this topic. These are just some questions, concerns, things that we're going to talk about in this series, so we hope you stay tuned, Uh, you know, that, that, that maybe you've thought about or somebody has asked you a question like that and you're like, yeah. When people ask me that question, I get nervous because I'm not sure what to say. Like, I'm not sure if, you know, if that's true, if that's in the Bible, you know, and you run off and then you're like, I hope God comes back soon. All right. You got it. Okay. So take a look at the screen just at some of the the questions or concerns. And maybe this is for you. Like, isn't it arrogant to think we are right and others are wrong when we share about Jesus? Like, anybody think about that? I'm like, I think about that all the time. Or aren't all religions really the same? Why are we doing, like, they maybe are, like, why are we doing this, right? This is a good question. If you don't have that question, you should. I was tricked with the fear of hell to believe. Many people have that. They're like, oh, boy. I I feel in the room. They're like, oh, yeah, that's me, but I won't nod. That's my family's here, and I don't want to talk about this. All right. I I don't want to pressure my kids to believe the way I was. Anyone? Whoa. That's a big one. So they're like, you know what? We're just going to let Netflix tell them what to believe. (laughs) We'll figure it out. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. And and, and Pastor Vijay and I were talking about this, and you'll meet him in a few weeks, but this was his question. The last one was really good. How do we share our faith in a way that is not offensive or disrespectful or weird? These are the kinds of questions that are always there. And we never talk about them, one, because it's challenging, or two, we only talk about them in a crisis. I remember years ago, I used to be a pastor on a university campus, and I was mentoring some guys, and we were talking. And over a period of time, one of the guys in the group that I was hanging out with, he started asking me about Buddhism. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Like, are you in a world religions class? Are you learning about religions? He's like, no, no, I'm just interested about Buddhism. I'm like, okay. But I kept watching, and it was kind of weird. And I realized he started to hang out with me and with a girl. So I'm like, hmm. I said, hey, that nice girl there. Are you friends? He goes, oh, maybe. I said, that's cool. And I was just encouraging them. They're on a university campus, whatever. And at one point, he says, hey, I have a question about Buddhism. Buddhism and Christianity, are they kind of the same? I was like, what? what are you talking about? He goes, because this girl, like, she's a Buddhist. And I, I think I'm a Christian, like I'm learning about Christianity, and they're kind of the same, right? I'm like, no, they're not. He's like, okay, they're not, they're not. I'm like, they're not. Now, that doesn't mean, like, you can't work this out. But in a practical way, some of these questions come up as we start to date other people. As our kids fall in love with somebody and you're like, I don't know if this translates. I don't know if they believe what we believe or what I've been taught to believe. And then people are like, I don't even know what I believe anymore. And they're like, run away. It's such a practical issue that we need to hold and learn and pray in a respectful way, in a way that honors others, in a way that makes room, and in a way where we continue to believe that Jesus is always helping us to share that there's something so good about the fact that he came and that he loves us. Something so profound about that. And so as we go through this series, I hope that you feel some of these questions, maybe new questions, Maybe other thoughts that you have. And to know, this is so important, to know that it's very, very safe to work through some of those questions with us. If you're in this room, you're watching at the well, you know somebody, you're not even ready to believe in any of this. Like you're like, oh my goodness, I'm so far from like this, I just came because I like somebody or my mother pressured me. You know, whatever. It's a safe place. 
It's so important that we help others understand that if they're not ready to believe, we understand. We know what it's like to have all these questions. We might not express them or share them, but we know what that's like. And we want you to know, if you're part of this church, and I know part of the well, they, they do this so well, is that this is a safe place for you to invite somebody who's not sure yet what they believe. They're not sure about why Jesus is good news, or why the cross, or why the... Like, it's okay, because only when people feel safe do they start telling you the truth. Remember that. Remember that with your kids. Remember that only as people start to feel safe do they start to say, if I tell you the truth, will you judge me? If I tell you the truth, will I be, like, set aside? And we need to hear the truth that's coming from the next generation. We need to hear what people are saying. And this is hard because for many of us, we've learned that it doesn't matter what they say. We're just praying here, and that's their problem, and God's going to deal with them. And, you know, that, that, that's not our problem. No, it is our problem. It's always been at the heart of the story of Jesus that Jesus cared about what others thought about him. And he helped his followers to step into the world and to, to pay attention to what are people saying. I think of my own family and people that I love, people that I care about, people that I've prayed about. They want nothing to do with church, nothing to do with God, nothing to do with faith. What does it mean to just listen and ask them why or what's happened or tell me about that painful moment again and just be there. Without feeling like, for me, I always had that temptation. Maybe you felt this. How do I defend God? How do I? And then you become like a salesperson. Well, let me just show you five easy tips on why God is real. You're like, oh my goodness. And right away, like people are like, I'm done. I'm out of here. The discipline of just listening. And if you're a parent especially, if you learn this now, it'll help you as your kids have questions and they have new concerns. I thought, imagine if we could help our church. If we could help you and those of you at the well, you're going to be able to be part of this as well. Like, if you could just hear from some of the best research out there that's mapping and tracking how things are changing in our culture. Now, I want to just begin maybe with the beginning, because if we're going to talk about the end of evangelism, maybe I want to tell you about the beginning of evangelism. That might help you. And if, again, if you've never heard the word evangelism, here's some, like, surprising note. It's nowhere in the Bible. Okay? The actual word to evangelize, evangelism, doesn't really appear in the Bible that way. It's a word that we use for what it means to reach or to share or to kind of just tell others of God's love. So just kind of feel that a little bit. And so I'm going to try to give you another word in a little while to help you. But one of the questions that I want to begin with is to maybe understand that not all religions care about this topic. So it's so important that if you're learning about this topic, especially in the context of Christianity, what's so important is to know that other religions do not evangelize, okay? Other religions don't think about, hey, I can't wait for you to kind of hear about Jesus and come and be part of our religion. Like there's many religions in the world that don't really have that belief in their belief system. For example, if you were a Buddhist, the heart of Buddhism is to experience enlightenment, not to be evangelized by somebody. If you're a part of a religion, for example, some traditional religions that you think of Islam, it's one of those religions where some people become Muslim, but they don't experience evangelism in the same way. They're just born into that tradition, to that faith tradition. So this is a very unique challenge that we feel as Christians. Like, it's kind of on us to think about this differently. And another group of people that you might have heard of who don't think about evangelism like this are the Jewish people. If you're not familiar with the Bible, you might not know this, but the Bible is made up of the New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament, right? And that's the story of Israel and the story of Jesus and the story of the Jewish people. If you were Jewish in the Bible times, it's very little examples that we have where the Jewish people are going out asking other people if they want to be Jews, if they want to follow Yahweh. You were born into the story of Israel, and that came with covenants, and especially if you were male, circumcision, which were markers that you've been born into the story. There's these ancient prayers in the Bible called the Psalms, and I'm going to read one for you that it's kind of like a, I think about it often when I think about this idea of what it means that you were born into the story of Israel when you were young. That's what it says. You brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. This is one of the most ancient prayers in the, in the Psalms, where for the Jewish people, there was a sense that God had made promises to the people of God, and as kids were born, they were born into this loving family, and they learned about God, and that was it. That was the flow. 
And that was the pattern. So even as you feel the question like, aren't all religions all, all the same? They're not. Because most people who think religions are all just all the same don't know anything about any of the religions. Okay, so just be very careful that you're just not tempted to feel that. And I know why we're tempted to feel that, because we don't want to have a conflict, right? Like, I don't want to fight with my neighbor who says they're another religion. Be like, let me show you how we're right and you're wrong. Nobody wants to do that. But we should understand that religions are just not the same. And one of the ways we learn this right away is when we talk about this topic. So for the Jewish people, there was a sense, all the other nations of the world that are not Jews, God's going to deal with them in his own time. But as for us, we're going to do this. We're going to follow him. We have examples where some people are like, the God of Israel, he's the real deal. Like, we should pay attention to that, right? But they didn't really become Jews. Tracking with me? People at the well, you got this, right? Smart church. I hear the really, really smart church. Smarter than us, right? Some of you are like, well, I'm not sure. Is dumb making fun of us? So the Jewish context. It's the beginning of the story. And then Jesus. Jesus shows up. And he's Jewish, and he's part of that story, and he's part of the, the story of Israel, and he comes to fulfill the great story of Israel, but he starts to do such unique things that nobody expects him to do. He starts to push against the story and to say that God has this beautiful story and, and plan for the Jewish people, but people who are not Jewish maybe have a place in the story. And people are like, whoa, wait a second, wait, no, what do you mean? It's about us, and God will figure out all the other people. If they don't turn, they're going to what? Some of you don't know. Okay, right. If they don't turn, they're going to burn. God will deal with them, right? That was the painful. You're like, really? And Jesus starts to use stories, and he starts to use parables. And this is one of my favorite parables that Jesus uses. It's a parable to start to push just the boundaries of, like, what's about to happen next is going to cause you to have to think about what it means that God loves other people the way he loves you. It's so beautiful. God loves people who think they're unlovable the way he loves you and me. God loves people who think they've messed up their lives so bad that God can never reach them. He loves them as well. God loves those who have such bruised stories that they feel they can never belong. God loves them as well. God cares about those who feel like they've messed up their lives so bad, and he loves them as well. And Jesus starts to come, and Jesus gets in so much trouble when he does this, right? Because he goes to those people who sometimes don't feel like they belong because they're on the outskirts, and Jesus is like, you know what? Instead of going there, let's go see them. And he's like with a person or a, a group, and he's starting to say things to them. This beautiful parable Jesus shares. Let me just read it for you. He says this, No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. Makes sense? I know nothing about wine, but it sounds like it makes sense. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. If you're familiar with the, the story or the culture of the Bible, you know that Jesus used these kind of stories that everybody would have understood. And he puts his finger on a really big problem in this parable. He says, all of you know that when something new happens especially with wine, you can't just hope it, it makes sense with something old. It's like he, he wants to emphasize that what was old was beautiful and important and part of the ancient story of Israel. None of that was bad. But now as something new is happening, don't try to just push them together or reconcile them in a way where you kind of will almost break both if you miss it. And then he, he kind of punches you right in the face with the last line. He says, and some of you are just going to be so enamored with the old because you'll keep saying it's so much better. You know anybody like that? Just the good old day. It was, it was better as old. If you don't know anybody like that, come and see me after the service. I'm going to introduce you to some of them. Oh, it was so much better. You know why it was better? Because it made sense to us. It was better because it fit. It was better because for many of us, maybe we remember hearing the story of God in a way that connected with us. And we're like, great, I can't wait to tell someone else. And I hope it helps them. And then it doesn't. And you're like, that didn't help at all. No. As Jesus does this, the people who are listening to him realize something new is happening here. Jesus says, I've come and I'm going to fulfill all the story of Israel. But also, as you see, soon something is about to unfold that's going to burst like wine. And it's going to be about what it means that other people will start to hear and understand how much they are loved. And that there's a place for them at the table of God. 
This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to think about. We're not just trying to trick people into signing a document or, you know, for me, it's like, you better say yes or when you die, who knows what's going to happen. I mean, those are such secondary concerns that we have to think about. As we begin, the end of evangelism helps with thinking about the beginning of evangelism, that Jesus starts to do this. Now, I told you I'd give you another word for maybe thinking about evangelism. And if you're at the well, we often do this here at the 180 and invite you to write something down or take notes or something. But I want you from now on to think about the, the word evangelism as the word that means good news. That's all it is. Evangelism is a big Bible teacher word that means a special kind of good news. This is so hard for us to connect with, right? Because we live in a world where there's fake news, where there's sad news, where there's bad news, and we're like, okay, let's get straight. Like in the midst of all of this broken world, you want us to keep believing that there's good news? Jesus is like, yes, that's exactly what I want you to believe. That there's not only good news because of how much God loves us, but there's good news because God is at work doing things you never thought he would do. That God is, is at work in your marriages and in your kids' lives and in your workplace and in our communities doing things, positioning certain things to create room so other people would be ready to hear about God's love. And I want to tell you something that everybody in the Bible knows that we often forget. And maybe you want to write this down if you're watching online or if you just want to remember this. That the word good news in the Bible was used by someone else more than anyone else in the Bible. Okay? If you want to think about it this way, is the word good news had a copyright on it. You know, like a copyright, if somebody else uses it, you could sue them. The word good news was that kind of a word. And the person who used this word with most precision and most kind of energy was the emperor of Rome. You see a picture of him up here. The first emperor of Rome and many of the emperors who will come after him will always use this idea that when they show up somewhere, it's good news for everybody. You know people like that? They're like big shot, big shot people. Anyway, nobody knows any of these people? Okay, I know some. They show up and everything, and you can't start the party until they show up. They show up late because everybody has to know they're so special. Some of you are smiling. I, you know, you know. Don't judge, but you know. Okay, the emperor had a way of making sure that when he showed up somewhere, like imagine he was going to show up at the, your Mother's Day shindig, right? He would send people in advance to start singing and celebrating. Oh, in about 30 minutes, it's going to be good news. It's like Santa. It's like, what are you talking about? The word good news was always linked to the power of the emperor of Rome. When he showed up, everybody better stand up and act like good news is about to happen. And if they didn't, they disappeared. Imagine that Jesus comes into a world where there's a kind of use of the word good news that is always linked to hypocrisy. Jesus knows that everybody knows in the Bible that it's so easy to talk about good news but live a life that looks more like bad news. It's so much easier to go to church and preach the good news but be a hypocrite because you don't really care about the good news. Or you care about the good news when it's only about you. In the Bible, that was the emperor. That was the emperor of Rome. He had a copyright on good news. So it's amazing that the earliest followers of Jesus will be like, when you share with other people, Tell them that there's a special understanding of the good news that I bring. It looks very different than the hypocrisy or the pain or the trickery that you've seen around you. Maybe for you this morning, maybe you're listening to this, and you feel like you're afraid to give God another chance because somebody talked about good news but act like a hypocrite. Somebody pretended to be a Christian but didn't model any of the ways of Jesus. And if you don't feel that, let me tell you, the next generation is going to have a lot of questions for us to answer about this. They, like people in the Bible, would have felt what it's like to use these words, to act Christian, to pretend you believe, but then when it mattered, none of that really connected. None of that was real. So just, I just want to give you the last thought before we just take communion together because they're so connected. It's that Jesus is going to tell his disciples, remember, he's teaching them with parables. He's teaching them to make room and to understand that something new is about to happen. But then he's going to tell them the most beautiful thing that's about to happen is that you too are going to play a part in this story for others. 
I, I, whenever I read passages in the Bible that have to do with us playing our part, I always get nervous. And when I'm praying, I always think, Jesus, have you met us? Like, have you met my kids? Have you met my family? Like, you sure this is, we're going to do that? You sure? She's like, it's going to be great. That one day when Jesus is talking to his followers and he's about to prepare them for this great opportunity, this is what he says. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, by the way, this is Easter season, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Ready for this? He says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This, if you remember anything at the beginning of this series, remember that before we ever share with anyone about how good God is, or about how much we hope they understand the story of Jesus, we remember that God is the one who does the sending first. All of evangelism begins with God first. God sends Jesus. It begins with him saying, like, I never learned this. Like, I was so upset when I started to learn this, because, like, I learned that God is holy. I learned that God is just. I learned that God cares. I learned that God is powerful. But nobody said God is a seeking, loving God who's looking and sends his son to find those who feel like they don't belong. It, that kind of got lost somewhere. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And Jesus is like, by the way, this idea of you sharing with other people how much I love you and how much the Father loves you is God the Father's idea. And he decided before you even knew that you were lost that he would come looking for you. Some of you know this story because I've shared it before. But when our youngest son was about two years old, and we lived in Ontario, we basically had a season, it was a weekend, our kids are playing, they're all young, we couldn't find him. He just like, you know, you're in your house, if you're a parent, you know, you have a little baby, they're playing with toys, you're like, you put them there, you turn around, you look back, they're not there. And you're like, well, whatever, they're somewhere else, so you start calling for them. And you're like, hey buddy, where are you? And now they're not, nowhere. they're like, oh, they're playing hide and go seek, I love this, I love it, it's great. Still, you're still like holding on to like, I'm going to put my house on fire. So we're going through the house and we can't find them anywhere. And one minute felt like one hour. And my wife and I are like, okay, babe, uh, I, I don't know where he is, but I'm trying to be strong. I'm like, I'm not going to overreact. I'm not going to overreact. And she's like, where is he? And she starts to yell. I'm like, forget, we're not going to overreact. We just went to the next level right now. Okay. <laughs> like it was like, a, my neighbor, she was yelling so much that my neighbors came outside. They're like, hey, guys, you okay? And I'm like, listen, we can't find our son. Like, and our backyard was like there was an opening, so you think of the worst, the worst of the worst. Like he went through the opening into the street. I start running in the middle of the street of my neighborhood. No shoes, yelling for people to help me find my son. To this day, I tell the story, and I feel like I'm right there. What would you do if you found out that one of your kids was missing? You would tear the world upside down to find. Why would you not think that God would do so much more for you? Why would you not think that Jesus is like, I will, I will come and it will be relentless until I find you? People need to know that that's the kind of God that we sing to. People need to know that that's the kind of Jesus we serve. And Jesus says to his followers that, by the way, this was God's idea that I would come so that you would know that you being lost is not the end of your life. And Jesus is like, I came, and then he does it. You're, right? you're like, no. He, does. he goes, hey, by the way, you're going to continue this. Now I'm sending you. And he breathes on them. He just, there's a sense that we're going to need supernatural strength of God to continue what God the Father, God the Son began before we were ever involved. And that we get to share in this story, that we to go and, and look for ways to say, God, would you just help us to know what it means that we are living in a time where nobody wants to hear this story, and even if they do, they are so confused, so confused. You know what? I have kids, and maybe you have somebody you work with. If you're a boss, you know this. You can send people to do stuff. If you've ever been a business owner, a leader, and you're the boss, and you send somebody to go somewhere, they go. If you ask them, go get me a coffee, they go get you a coffee. If you say, do this, it doesn't work on ch church staff, but I try, right? It doesn't work. 
I love our staff. I'm kidding. But uh, it's this idea there's a sentness that comes with a, a strange control. But then there's a sentness that comes with a shared love. And Jesus says, I now call you friends. You're my friends now. Go and continue what I started. Go and do this. For the next few weeks together, we're going to look and feel and live in some of these practical questions. And can I ask you to pay attention in your heart when maybe you realize that you don't care anymore about those who are not here, that you've stopped praying or caring or, or trying to be open to learn about what it means that we have a part to play. In a few minutes, we're going to come to the communion table. And for those of you at the well, I know you're going to celebrate communion as well. So I, I just want you to think about one simple idea that evangelism or sharing about God's love or living in the truth of this story begins with knowing that God loved us when we were a mess. It begins there. And every time we come to this table, we get a chance to ask God to reveal to us things in our lives that maybe have made us a stumbling block to other people. This is a very simple prayer this morning. That coming to this table is a, a, just an invitation for God to say, hey, there's areas in your life that when people see you, they don't connect your life with God's love. They don't. That we get a chance to kind of come and ask God to forgive us and to remind us that what He's calling us to do is only possible because of the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit breeds on the disciples and they're going to go now. They're about to go out and they have no idea. Wait till they find out that they have to learn French and English and all these other languages. Wait, just wait. They have no idea how difficult it's going to be. But Jesus says, it's so great that you're going to experience what it's like to go and continue what you've seen me do. It's one of the most beautiful things that we get to celebrate and be a part of. And it happens in these profound moments when we get honest to say, God, are there areas in my life that will keep me from doing what you've called me to do? We're going to sing a song in a minute, and I just want to tell you the story that before we sing it, that a few weeks ago I sat in this church. And it's a picture of a church here, and it's in London, England. It's a very famous church. Bev and I, and actually Vijay and, and some of the leaders across Canada sat in that church. That's the church that a famous preacher called John Newton would preach in. Years in his life, after God began to help him understand that the life he was living was destroying other people's lives. John Newton was a famous captain of a ship, and he was involved for years in the slave trade and across the world. And at times he realized like, that there was people who were being used as slaves and some, of, some people were fine with that and for a long time he was fine with that and it just hit him one day like, that it would be unacceptable to be involved in such a horrible thing. And over time, God started to work on his heart where he realized, I'm the problem. God has to heal me. God has to change me. I have to come to him first before I can share with anyone else of his love. I need to have experienced it first myself. Many people just know the famous song that John Newton wrote called Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace comes out of the deep pain of somebody willing to admit that they were wrong and that they needed to confess all of those things to God. This deep pain of surrender, I feel that if we don't get to that place again, the next generation won't understand the good news of Jesus. They are living with stories filled with pain of things that other people have done, things that we have done. And this is a great chance for us to talk about the end of evangelism by starting with the beginning of evangelism. That God finds us.